So did you ever do this exercise growing up? It's called point perspective. It's the proper way to show how and why objects closer to us appear bigger and those further away appear smaller. It creates a realistic sense of space on a two-dimensional surface, like paper or canvas or a screen. But did you know that this was an invention? A discovery? I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. Our sense of three-dimensional space as represented on two-dimensional space didn't always have to be this way, and, well, for a long time, it wasn't. Well, ancient and classical artists had some sense of the phenomenon. Egyptian wall paintings, for example, show figures of wildly different sizes in scenes implying large figures are closer and smaller ones are further away. But this particular form of perspective was, well, developed, the formula discovered by mathematicians in the European Renaissance. And it's not the only way to represent the world. Earlier traditions in both Europe and Asia used what's called oblique perspective. It's a sort of three-quarter over-the-shoulder view that used a regular but kind of estimated reduction of the size of figures instead of the formulaic one associated with point perspective. The big point that I'm trying to get at here is that realism, so something that a lot of people hold in very high regard when it comes to art and artistic talent, it's a trick. Illusion, Michael. Put another way, realism is a manipulation of a set of techniques and skills on the part of an artist in an effort of a particular goal. Illusion. To trick viewers into thinking that two dimensions are three dimensions. Which isn't to bash realism at all, but as a set of techniques, it holds a lot of sway. People think that in order to be a good artist, you have to be good at realism. But just like being good at the trumpet doesn't make you an inherently better musician than someone who's really good at the violin. Well, being good at realistic art doesn't necessarily make you a more talented artist than someone who's a really good cartoonist or an expressionist. We'll return to ideas about art styles later, but I've brought up realism because today I want to discuss three elements of visual rhetoric that are closely tied to the technique of realism. Texture, value, and size. Let's start with texture. Texture has a sort of twofold definition. It can refer to the perceived surface of a work of art and its components, or to the actual surface of a work of art and its components. See, an artist can create the illusion of many textures on a completely smooth sheet of paper, or create an image that seems very smooth even though they're using lots of actually ridged paint strokes. Thick paint strokes, collage, and plenty of other structural elements can add both perceived and actual texture to a work of art. And this is important for the illusory process of mimesis. You want your new car to look like shiny, smooth metal, and your gnarly tree to look like it has craggy bark, and, well, not vice versa. But textures can also have emotive qualities, of course. Sharp, pointy objects can ping anxieties, and soft textures are welcoming and safe. Heck, in books like Ed Pisker's X-Men Grand Design, he uses particular coloring processes, but also chooses the paper stock, not just to mimic the look of older comics, but also to recreate the texture of old comic book paper to the best of his ability. Now, old comic book paper was really cheap, and his is actually pretty nice stock, but there's powerful nostalgia to be mined in that texture. Value refers to the relative darkness or lightness of colors. Talked a little bit about this last week. Value is how artists create the illusion of light, and shadow, of three-dimensional shapes reflecting light in particular ways. Another way most people sort of think of value is shading. It's all about value. It's And, well, realistic shading is one of the things that's most commonly associated with realism. In addition to being a powerful tool for affecting realistic shapes, value is a powerful compositional tool. Take, for example, the technique called chiaroscuro. This refers to artwork in which a strong, intense contrast in value guides composition. In art history, it's perhaps most famously associated with the Baroque paintings of Caravaggio, though it's also a really important tool in black and white photography and film, especially those of the Weimar period in Germany. In sure, scroll works like these, the dark sections are very, very dark, the bright sections are very, very bright, and the contrast creates a powerful, striking composition. Something about the tension between these opposites creates a sense of intensity to chiaroscuro designs. Now, artists don't need to use extreme chiaroscuro or realism to have their value affect compositions. 
Darker and lighter tones frequently guide readers' eyes across an image. In comics, this can happen both within panels, but often the overall value of panels themselves interact as units on a page. A great example of this is John Higgins coloring on a lot of pages of Watchmen. Now, finally, there's size. Now, the realism part of size is, for example, the way in which the size of an object appears to diminish as it moves further away, or appears larger as it gets nearer to you. And there's a mathematical equation to this size change, and that's what point perspective is about and why you need rulers to do it. But of course, there's also a lot of baggage that comes with size. We put a lot of emphasis on size. Things that are big are awe-inspiring and engrossing and even frightening. And a lot of people are surprised, for example, when they see the real Mona Lisa. It's an image that looms so large in world consciousness, such a famous image, it's been reproduced everywhere on mugs and t-shirts and hell even sides of buildings, but the painting is, well, it's less than three by two feet. And because it's behind glass and ropes and you can't get near it and there's usually a ton of people in front of it, well, it feels even smaller than that. So a lot of people's experience of Mona Lisa, it's, well, it's not a Cameron Fry meeting Syrah at the Chicago Museum of Art is what I'm saying. Bigger is better. Well, except when it's not. But regardless of questions of value, our eyes are almost always drawn to the biggest thing first. If there are multiple elements on a page, in other words, we're going to see the big, bold one before we notice a tiny detail. Now, that doesn't mean that the big thing is the most important thing in the long run, but it's going to make the initial impact. Space can affect the interior of a page, the size of the panels themselves, the components within panels, and heck, don't forget text, but it can also affect the way we interact with an object itself. Quick example. Here's this great little book, uh, my sort of pocket mass market edition of Tombs of Atuan. You can tell it's been well loved and read, probably actually stuck in my pocket at many times. Uh, this is something I could read in bed and hold close to my face. I equally love this book. This is a collection of Jaime Hernandez's Maggie and Hopi stories called Lucas. It's a, it's a beautiful tome. And I've read through it, but you can't read it in bed the same way as you can my little novel. It's too heavy for one thing, but it certainly makes these texts feel, well, <clears throat> important, as important as they are to me. And I have a different experience again reading the monthly issues. The weight, the size, these have literal physical impacts on how I read them, and also emotional impacts because of how we interact with them. Besides that, in comics, time moves in space. So space, which, well, is measured in size on a two-dimensional surface, is connected to how comics portray the passage of time. Now, I'm going to do a whole episode soon on the nature of time in comics, so that's all I'll say for now, but suffice to say, size plays a big part in how comics show time. So the basic definitions of these elements, the perceived surface level of a work of art, the relative lightness and darkness of elements in a work of art, and the relative size of elements in a work of art, these are all obviously pretty important things to think about when you're interpreting any art object. But hopefully some of what I've talked about today has opened up the ways in which these elements affect more than just what their definitions imply. They're connected to ideas about what we value in art in the first place, whether it's the extreme emphasis we place on realism or the bigger, deeper, and even subconscious reactions we sometimes have to the world around us, like, well, seeing the big things first. There are two more bits of visual rhetoric to discuss. They're coming soon. Thanks for your patience during this busy time. I should be back to regular schedule next week uh, without any more bumps in the road. See you then.